Now, tonight at 10.30, the royal blunder that puts Sophie and Edward in the tabloid spotlight. First and foremost, the truth about one of the monarchy's most colourful characters, the real Edward VII. At the funeral of Queen Victoria in 1901, her eldest son, now King Edward VII, saluted the crowd from a splendid black horse. This was what he'd been waiting for all his life, and what his mother had always dreaded. He was unfit to be king as far as she was concerned. He could not succeed. Edward had been king in waiting for almost 60 years. Denied a real job, he had sought rewards elsewhere. He simply lived for pleasure. He was a great aphrodisiac, I mean, a member of, of a royal family. And he certainly was a man who took advantage of whatever was going. Once king, he turned himself into a figurehead surrounded by pomp and circumstance. He was a very, very visible king. He loved ceremonials. And he was tremendously good at it. He was, in the words of the song, doing the what comes naturally. But the prince who scandalized Victorian society and became a king who indulged his passion for royal pageantry turned out to be the role model for modern monarchs. The future King Edward VII was born in 1841. This family portrait, painted when he was five, hints at what would become the central conflict of Edward's life, his relationship with his parents. The Queen and Prince Albert looking regal, the Prince with an admonishing finger towards his heir apparent. Victoria looking out to the world, not looking at her family at all, in regal serenity. Edward carried an extraordinary burden of expectation. Victoria announced the birth of her son and heir to a relation by saying, He is to be called Albert, and Edward is to be his second name. You will understand how fervent my prayers are to see him resemble his angelic, dearest father in every... She and Albert certainly had a very passionate marriage. That in some way explains her relationship, perhaps, with her children. Sometimes the children of lovers are orphans. That's what happened to the royal children. They were somewhat excluded from the bond between their parents. Edward's isolation was increased by his parents' other mutual passion, the family business. These twin deaths, pushed close together like that, symbolize absolutely the royal firm, the king, the king and queen as a partnership, as a ruling partnership. Victoria's death with her pictures on it, with all her uh, writing implements, the, the knobs to call the servants, Albert's death with his blotter, his inkstand. And they pushed their desks together and would work side by side on papers of state, on royal dispatches. For Victoria, hard work offered protection from her dark side, which she feared she had inherited from her wicked uncles. That's what she called her predecessors, the Hanoverians. Victoria believed her uncle's excesses had almost ruined the monarchy's prestige. With Albert's help, she set out to repair that damage. Central to the plan was Albert Edward, known as Bertie. From the age of seven, he was subjected to a grueling academic program designed to suppress Hanoverian style self-indulgence. The study regime that Albert prepared for his son uh, began at about six hours a day of tutorial study. Uh, gradually, it was extended to about eight hours a day. But Edward was slow to learn, slow to read, uh, slow to write. He wasn't very good in mathematics. He wasn't very good in reading. Uh, he wasn't 
very good in history. He was a terrible his history scholar, uh, and his father was appalled. Edward probably had uh, attention deficit disorder, uh, which meant that he was impulsive, that he, he was inattentive, uh, he was in need of constant physical activity. The boy rebelled. His tutor described how once Bertie had thrown dirt and swung a large stick at me. Another time, when the prince was 11. Uh, he went to the window, stared out the window, and eventually when he was asked to come back to his desk, his father had to thrash him for that. Because of his willfulness, his stubbornness, his... Uh, Sad and anxious about him. He is so idle and weak. It was one thing to say that he ought to be an example to his future subjects, but to say that he should be exactly like his father was too demanding. And uh, the parents therefore left him with a sort of perpetual sense of failure. A rare break from this misery came in 1855. The 14-year-old Prince of Wales went with his parents on a state visit to the court of the Emperor and Empress of France. Now they were exactly the kind of people that suited the temperament of the young Prince of Wales, was unlike his own parents. They lived for pleasure, they loved clothes, they loved excitement, they loved balls, they loved dances. This simply set his, his pulses racing. And he was clearly gobsmacked, to use a modern phrase, by the sort of wonderful um, uh, vivacity and, uh, and uh, lack of pomp and circumstance, and of course all these gorgeous women. There they all were in their ball gowns and they're bowing to him, and to a 14 year old boy, what more do you want? The imperial couple made a tremendous fuss of the teenager. Edward's response revealed the depths of his unhappiness. When they were about to leave, Edward told Napoleon, you have a very nice country. I wish you were my father. And he wanted to stay in France. And the emperor said, oh, you can't stay here. They need you back home. Home, for much of Edward's childhood, was Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. It was meant to be a holiday home, but there was no let up in the character building regime. At Osborne, the playground was an allotment. And the idea of uh, Victoria and Albert for the children with these gardens was to make them productive, was to make them work hard and systematically. It was a regulated childhood and they grew vegetables and vegetables were checked and if they were of sufficiently high quality they were actually sold to the house so in a sense make them part of the domestic economy and make them very responsible citizens from a very early age his high-minded parents despaired of the teenage Edward looking ahead Victoria fretted about what would happen when the young prince was old enough to do as he wanted Bertie continues such an anxiety tremble at the thought of when he will be of age and we can't hold him. It is too awful a contemplation. In 1860, Edward's parents took a gamble. Hoping to confront him with the awesome... Re they made him stand in for the Queen on an historic three-month tour of staunchly Republican America. He was just 18 when he became the first British royal to visit the United States. He was a very important person, uh, literally a VIP, as we would use the term now. At almost every stop, there was a ball in his honor. He even went to the White House and was greeted by uh, President Buchanan, and he learned how to handle this with grace. Edward lapped up the applause, on one occasion exclaiming in delight, this for me, all for me. Nourished by the warm reception, a new Edward blossomed. His geniality shone through, and people talked about him constantly as the genial prince. The trip was a tremendous success. Uh, it was a success for British foreign policy. It was a triumph. Edward had learned that for a royal, smiling and being charming were just as useful as desk work, the last thing his parents wanted him to discover. Letters were written home by 
the minister who was with him and that sort of thing, saying what a splendid success he'd been. And Prince Albert simply refused to believe it. And he wrote him a rather disagreeable letter, saying that it, he mustn't allow his success to go to his head. The American tour was a great success. I mean, he was an absolute celebrity. Um, all his best side was shown. I mean, his sociability, his diplomacy, um, all that came out. He really made a great success of it. I mean, he was a very young man when he went, but his parents didn't appreciate that. They didn't congratulate him on it. And it was another example, I think, of them wanting him to be something else, something that he never was and never would be. On his return, Edward was told to reapply himself to the doomed attempt to be like his father. He was now to become an intellectual. In 1861, he went up to Cambridge University. But unlike other students, he didn't take rooms in college. Instead, he was installed here at Maddingley Hall and closely watched by hand-picked guardians. When we realize that Mattingly Hall is four miles from the campus of the university, we understand something uh, of why he was here. Uh, the royal family did not want him with undergraduates. Uh, they didn't want him too close to the uh, decadent gentlemen who were students at Cambridge. But Edward invited some fellow students to Mattingly. Among them was Nathaniel Rothschild, who wrote... I have received an invitation to dine at the lodge on the 28th to meet the Prince of Wales. The Prince is kept very strict and cannot even ask anyone to Mattingly. He is very fond of riddles and strong cigars. If he followed the bent of his own inclination, it strikes me he would take to gambling and certainly keep away from the law lectures he is obliged to go to now. Rothschild was perceptive. When the Prince found ways of giving his miners the slip, the real Edward emerged. The temper tantrums of his uh, younger days were over. Uh, he was learning how to enjoy himself. With his friends, he spent most of his time at play. They went out hunting, they went to the races, they played cards late into the night. He was at his heart's desire when he was with students who filled the rooms with cigar smoke. At university, Edward learned little that his parents approved of but he did develop a gargantuan appetite for sensual pleasure. He needed as much as he could get in of gratification, you know, whether it was food or smoking these huge cigars or the excitement that was generated by gambling. Whatever it was, it had to be now, it had to be fulfilling, and it had to make up for the empty space that was left behind from the sort of childhood that was not really a childhood at all. Cambridge would provide the backdrop to the greatest crisis of the prince's life, all because of a practical joke by some of Edward's raucous new friends. They contrived to get a young lady of what I think is called easy virtue, called Nellie Clifton, to get into his bedroom one night uh, and to stay the night with him. He was delighted by Nellie Clifton and uh, Apparently, everybody knew that Nellie was now a mistress of his. Albert found out and was appalled. I write to you with a heavy heart on a subject which has caused me the deepest pain. I having to address my son as one who has sunk into vice and debauchery. Victoria, don't forget, and of course um, her husband Albert too, were very anxious about her mad, dissolute uncles. Anything that suggested a sort of throwback to their dissolute ways appalled them. Edward, after all, was the heir to the throne, and he had to live um, a life which was exemplary, as a sort of a monarch to be respected, not a monarch of license and carnival. Both parents overreacted, deeply concerned, and decided that he must pay a visit to the Prince of Wales at Cambridge. Albert was in no condition to make this journey. Albert at this point was a sick man. He was very likely dying of cancer. We know from the symptoms that he uh, expressed in his diaries and in his letters uh, that 
he knew that he had something inoperable and that he didn't have long to live. Not wishing to be overheard, Albert took Edward on a long walk to lecture him about what he called the evil deed. The weather was poor. It was cold. It was November. Albert almost certainly caught pneumonia. He took to his bed as soon as he got back to Windsor, uh, and in two weeks he was dead. On the 23rd of December, 1861, Prince Albert was buried in the chapel at Windsor. Victoria was absolutely distraught with grief. She really felt that her life was over. She'd seen the monarchy very much by that time as a partnership. She had not only lost an emotional partner, her helpmeet, but she'd almost so lost her sort of business partner, her working partner. And at that time, she didn't seem to take very much comfort in her children. The regretful prince wrote to a Cambridge friend about his late father, admitting, I fear I have often given him pain by my conduct. By the time he wrote this letter, Edward had already dropped out of university. He knew that the most happy time of his life was over, that he would never be able to retrieve those years. He would have liked to have stayed longer, but he now felt that he had to take his father's place to be the leading male member of the royal family. But Edward was in for a shock. The Queen attributed Albert's death, I mean, totally irrationally and unjustly, to the Prince of Wales. And she wrote a letter to her daughter, Vicky, uh, after Prince Albert had died at the end of 1861. And she said in this letter, it was Bertie's fall, that's what she referred to the incident with Nellie Clifton as, Bertie's fall killed his father. And then she said, it's rather awful, that, oh, that boy. I never can or shall look at him without a shudder. You've killed your father. I mean, a dreadful thing to tell a child, isn't it? And uh, he carried the burden of patricide for the rest of his life. Queen Victoria mourned her dead husband, Prince Albert, with the same single-minded passion that she had loved him. Here at Osborne, there's a painting of Albert, painted in fact in the year of his death, 1861. And if we cross to the other side of the fireplace, there is a marble bust of Albert, and over there there's another portrait of Albert sitting, looking relaxed. There was an important matter of state or a family matter which concerned her. She would actually go and consult with the bust of Albert. You know, Albert, in a sense, presence was everywhere for Victoria. He may have been dead, but Victoria continued Albert's improvement scheme for their son and heir. My firm resolve, my irrevocable decision, is that his wishes, his plans about everything, are to be my law. I apply this particularly as regards our children, Bertie, etc., for whose future he had traced everything so carefully. Albert had believed that marriage offered the only hope of salvation for his wayward son. So Victoria now searched for a bride and a future queen. The act of succession made it necessary that he have a Protestant bride, and the bride had to be within certain age range, and she also had to be attractive. Uh, pictures were solicited from various courts. Edward's elder sister, Vicky, had recently married Prince Frederick of Prussia. So she was well placed to trawl the Protestant courts of Northern Europe for a suitable bride. She sent her mother photos and descriptions of the leading candidates. I do not think the Princess of Hesse very pretty. She had not a fine figure and her teeth are nearly spoiled. Princess of Viet is so odd. She talks so much and laughs so loud. Eventually, a winner was found. I never set eyes on a sweeter creature than Princess Alex. She is very healthy. This was Alexandra of Denmark. Alexandra was very young. She was 17 at most when they first targeted her, possibly even 16. She was one of the most beautiful girls in Europe, and they thought that that would perhaps be sufficient to 
make her attractive to the Prince of Wales. And so they decided that they must get on with it and, and, and that she was the wife for him. Edward was dispatched to the continent. Left alone with his mail order bride, he did his duty and proposed. It is difficult to say quite how passionately he fell in love with her at the time, but I think perhaps fell more in love with him than he with her. She once said that even if he'd been a cowboy, uh, she would have wanted to marry him. Edward married Alexandra on the 23rd of April, 1863. He was 21. But the blessing of the young couple felt less like a wedding, more like a funeral, all thanks to Victoria. In this wonderful photograph, instead of looking with pride at her son and his new bride and smiling benevolently, she's actually turned away and looking at a bust of her late husband. It was a very dismal business, and she made it even more dismal by taking the bride and groom before the marriage to the mausoleum where Albert was, uh, uh, was buried. She's saying, this is the father that would have been there to bless you, and this is the father that is always there. This is the father to whom you have to live up. It is a, a, a most poignant picture. Marriage did have advantages for Edward, notably a home of his own. Well, this is Marlborough House in London, and this was his marital home. He moved in here in 1863, just after he married Princess Alexandra. You can see how living in a place like this uh, must have reinforced the idea that Edward always had of his status as a prince. Independence liberated Edward's natural instincts, which his parents have tried so hard to suppress. He and Alexandra held parties every night, and few would refuse an invitation from the Prince of Wales. Soon, Edward and his smart friends were known as the Marlborough House Set. He needed people, he needed social input, and he needed all the excitement and love and attention that uh, one gets when life is just one long party. Victoria was not amused. She felt that Alexandra was not very clever and had not acted as the sobering influence which she had hoped for. I fear Bertie and Alex will be nothing but two puppets running about for show all day and night. It is regretted by everyone. The marriage worked for a time because Alexander was liberated just as, uh, as the prince was liberated by the marriage, but it ended. Years of marriage, Alexandra bore two children. Then during her third pregnancy, she fell seriously ill. The prince claimed loyally that he was going to stay by her. He moved the desk into her bedroom so that he could write letters and conduct uh, domestic business. Uh, literally from her bedroom. But then her mother came from Denmark to help take care of her, and he was liberated from having to be a loyal husband. And that was the end of it. After that, the marriage went steadily downhill. Although he had tried hard to behave like his noble father, Edward was no Prince Albert. He took a long time to grow up. He probably, in retrospect, married too young. He was only 21 when he got married never really had time for so many wild oats. And I think probably he wasn't a very likable young man, and not a very intelligent young man, and probably rather boorish and self-centered and arrogant. Walton Hall in Warwickshire, for centuries the seat of the Mordaunt family. A member of that family, Elizabeth Lady Hamilton, has written a history of a real-life Victorian melodrama that took place here. It involved Edward and the owners of the house, Sir Charles Mordaunt and his wife, Harriet. Sir Charles was a country gentleman, and he was not in the smart set at all, whereas his wife was. 
she married Sir Charles for his house rather than him himself. That was my impression. And she had uh, become friendly with the Prince of Wales. But Sir Charles was warned that the Prince of Wales um, had a little eye for his wife, and he was absolutely determined that the Prince wouldn't be invited to come here. But in the summer of 1868, Sir Charles went on a fishing holiday to Norway, and Edward raced up to Walton Hall. He had invited himself to view some grey ponies that Harriet had bought from the royal stables. There she was, wheeling around, looking very pretty, I'm sure. Sir Charles wasn't expected back for days. But fishing in Norway was very bad that year. It had been a heat wave, and most of the fish had been already caught. The salmon had been already caught, so he decided he'd come home to see his lovely wife. He was missing her. Sir Charles was outraged. The prince beat a retreat, leaving the irate husband to vent his anger. Afterwards, he gave orders for the ponies to be brought out. And uh, Lady Mordaunt was brought down onto the... And then the following year, Lady Mordaunt gave birth to a baby here at Walton Hall. Then she became very agitated, and uh, Sir Charles kept asking her what was the matter, what's wrong. And eventually she told him very foolishly. She said that she thought that the child was not his, and that one of several men could have been the father. And among those she, she mentioned was the Prince of Wales himself. Sir Charles Mordaunt wanted a divorce. Edward now faced public disgrace as an adulterer. The only ray of hope was that Harriet appeared to be going mad. This made her confession of adultery suspect. And under Victorian law, an insane person could not be divorced. But Sir Charles was stubborn. He intended to prove in court his wife was sane. The trial would hinge on Harriet's confession of adultery. Edward took the stand, the first heir to appear in a court of law for almost 500 years. He came into the witness box and was asked flatly whether he had or had not committed an act of impropriety with Lady Mordaunt, to which he replied, no, he did not, <laughs> had not. The court then heard from Dr. William Gull, Edward's personal physician, who said that in his expert opinion, Harriet was insane. On the testimony of a prince and the diagnosis of an eminent doctor, Harriet was declared mentally unfit. She spent the rest of her life in an asylum, her claims of adultery dismissed as fantasy. Edward had got away with it. He has the opportunity, because of his very specially elevated status, to be above the normal sins that ordinary people uh, get stuck with. And he learned it, and he learned that it was useful to him uh, to have that status. By the time he turned 30, Edward's relationship with Princess Alexandra was a marriage in name only. And for the rest of his life, he would enjoy a string of exotic affairs. There was Lily Langtree, a model turned actress. Cora Pearl, a famous courtesan. Lady Daisy Brooke, whom he called my darling Daisy wife. any Prince of Wales, um, he can simply, the, 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 the opportunities are absolutely endless. And once women realised what he was like, um, he in a way became fair game for any kind of adventurers. At house parties, he would sleep with a woman for one night, he might go to Paris, sleep with a woman there. In Paris, there was a can-can dancer at the Moulin Rouge. Well, he, frankly, he went to brothels when he was in Paris. This was one of the great attractions of, of Paris for him. With the best will in the world, he really couldn't stop himself. Victoria and Albert had set to create the perfect prince. Instead, they had produced Edward the Caresser. By the time he turned 30, the future King Edward VII had few illusions about what being Prince of Wales meant. Wealth, status, and unemployment. He wrote to his mother saying, I should be very glad 
glad to have an opportunity to discuss the subject of some useful employment as your eldest son, and which I'm as anxious as ever to obtain. Queen Victoria was a busy monarch. She worked her way through the red boxes which contained government papers, commenting and interfering. Her late husband, Prince Albert, had helped with her workload, and even had his own key to the boxes. When Edward asked for one, Victoria replied, You could not well have a government key, which only ministers and those immediately connected with them, or with me, have. The prince was impulsive, and his impulsiveness led him into indiscretion, and she realized that to give him any access to information was wrong, uh, because he could not contain it. And she wanted to keep in full control, and so she was very, very reluctant to let him see government dispatches or any foreign office documents or anything like that. In many ways, she fueled the fire of um, Edward's rather unemployed youth style of life because he wasn't seen to have a role in it. It must have been very frustrating and somewhat humiliating. Dismissed as worthless and irresponsible, Edward sought distraction in the social world. And as Prince of Wales, there were plenty of people willing to amuse him. Christopher Sykes is a descendant of a leading member of Edward's Marlborough House set. It's rather lucky that great-great-uncle Christopher left us this fantastic legacy in the form of these wonderful photograph albums, which really chart his, his social life. There is Christopher Sykes. Oh, he's enormously tall. That's the Prince of Wales looking very young with a jaunty bowler hat. I mean, the Prince Edward was a pleasure seeker. His social life was sort of endless round. A Goodwood house here, this would have been for the races. This is a shooting party at Eastwell, Wadston, the Rothschild's house. Lord Londonderry's house, famous for its enormous shoot. Prince Edward would like to shoot thousands of birds. Christopher became known for being one of the great hosts. You know, you knew, knew exactly how to please the prince, and you know, each party would be more and more lavish. As well as exploiting their hospitality, Edward found that he could vent his frustrations on his hangers on. At some dinner party at Marlborough House, the prince poured a glass of brandy over Christopher, and Christopher just sat there with the brandy trickling down his face, and then sort of very slowly turned to the prince and just bowed his head and said, as your royal highness pleases. Now that caused absolute sort of uproar amongst all the other guests, but it was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. And from that moment onwards, there was sort of no hell's barred as far as teasing Christopher was concerned. You know, they used to sort of put him under the dining room table and spear him with billiard cues. And they put live animals in his bed. Well, he was a bit of a bully, Edward. He enjoyed ha having the power over people. Christopher Sykes' friendship with the prince ended up costing him more than his self-respect. They went bankrupt, unfortunately, and they just blew every penny he had. He died sort of penniless. Very well, rather sad, really. Poor Bertie gives much cause for remarks of no good natured kind. He is more and more careless. No one looks up to him. Victoria feared that Edward's lifestyle was damaging the image of the monarchy, but her own behavior wasn't helping either. There was a lot of Republican agitation. The idea that the Queen. Uh, was invisible, uh, having continued her mourning. The government was paying a lot of money to maintain a monarchy, and she was not there. She would not open Parliament. She would not appear in public in almost any way. Edward, meanwhile, was more and more rumored to be involved in uh, what amounted to uh, problems. The popularity of the monarchy was sinking until fate and bad drains intervened. Bertie, in December of uh, 1870, caught typhoid. And this really was a turning point. The Queen rushed to Sandringham, where, where he was. She took complete charge of the household. She was 
the killer. The plight of the royal family touched a nerve. The invisible queen and her playboy heir became just a terrified mother and her dying son. Edward's timing was perfect. His illness reached its climax on the same day of the year his father had died. On the morning of December the 14th, he suddenly opened his eyes, saw the Queen, and said, how very kind it is of you to come and see me. Two months later, Edward, still weak from his illness, went to St. Paul's Cathedral to publicly give thanks for his recovery. Thousands came to watch and cheer. Totally by accident, the Prince of Wales had pulled up British Republicanism by its feeble roots. The result was a feeling of great relief around the country that the succession had been saved, that uh, Albert Edward was going to survive and become king. And uh, it was also thought that because he had come through this near-death experience, that he would be renewed, he'd be a different person, uh, that he would understand that he had a new chance at making a dignified life for himself. If this great warning is not taken, and the wonderful sympathy and devotion of the whole nation does not make a change in him, it will be worse than before, and his utter ruin. For once, Victoria followed her own advice. She gave her son a job. In 1875, he was sent to India on the first royal visit since the mutiny. There was no chance that his mother was ever going to go to India. In fact, I don't think she ever visited any of her dependencies around the world anywhere. It was a means of associating him with, you know, to use a, a much used metaphor, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire, and to show that he could go abroad as a representative, not just of his country, but of his family and the institution that they represented. And it certainly was very good for his own public relations. Edward had been persuaded to visit India by the prospect of the hunting. And along the way, he did manage to bag eight tigers. But amidst the carnage, the prince's personality, above all his easygoing charm, served him well. He enjoyed himself, but he also represented the crown, and he did so with flair, with dignity, uh, with great ceremony. He was a tremendous envoy, ambassador extraordinary. It was a complete success. But any pride Edward might have felt was ruined when he read in the Calcutta Times that back home, his mother had been created. He now saw his hunting trip had a secret agenda, to test public reaction to the Queen in the wake of the mutiny. And no one had told him. The Prince wrote home complaining, as the Queen's eldest son, I think I have some right to feel annoyed. Adding, I should have received some intimation of the subject from the Prime Minister. The monarchs think they want to have an heir, but in fact it's the last thing that they want to have. In a way, she was sort of trying to train him for monarchy, but of course she kept him in this perpetually infantilized state. Denied a meaningful role, Edward approached middle age as a loose cannon on a ship of state. Disaster was inevitable, and when it came, would be as spectacular as anything in his life so far. Family court. It was, I suppose, the stately home of a family called Wilson, who made a lot of money in shipbuilding. The disparaging term, I suppose, was nouveau riche. And Mrs. Wilson wanted to get into society. And the way to get into society was, indeed, to become a friend of the Prince of Wales. Edward came to stay at Tramby Croft in September 1890, during the Doncaster races. And it was here that his playboy lifestyle reached its climax, triggered by the scandalous behavior of one of Edward's favorite cronies, William Gordon Cumming. This is the room where the famous scandal took place. Having had a lovely day at the races, having had a splendid meal and everything else, the Prince of Wales turned round and said, and now we will play cards. And the cards 
and he wanted above all else, because he was addicted to it, was this illegal one of Baccarat. Baccarat gambling was illegal because this was a game of pure chance. Edward's easygoing set flouted the law. Far more important to them were unwritten rules governing conduct at the card table. And at Tramby Croft, one of these rules was broken. The son of the household, young Mr. Wilson, thought he saw Gordon coming cheating. And moving his counters after the stakes had been agreed. And gradually, a for cheats was exposure. But they couldn't expose Gordon Cumming without revealing that the heir to the throne had sat in on an illegal card game. So Edward told his friends to deal with the cheat as quietly as possible. So they then decided on a disastrous plan, which was to persuade William Gordon Cumming to sign a document undertaking never to play cards again. And if he did that, then they wouldn't tell anybody and nobody would be prosecuted. Although Gordon Cumming denied he had cheated, he signed, saying that he was doing so to protect the prince from public scandal. And there, the Tramby Croft affair should have ended. If only those in the know could keep their mouths shut. It is believed that the Prince of Wales told one of his friends, a lady called Daisy Brooke. Now, Daisy Brooke's nickname gives her away. She was known as the Babylon Brook. Soon, the whole of London was talking about nothing else. Now the secret was out. Gordon Cumming had to defend his reputation. So he sued his accusers for slander. Although not a defendant, Edward was summoned as a key witness. This was very embarrassing. Age 50, he would be in court again. Queen Victoria was dismayed. It is a fearful humiliation to see the future king of this country dragged, and for the second time, through the dirt in a court of justice. A terrible humiliation. Edward was furious. He felt Gordon Cumming had no right to wash his dirty linen in public and so risked damaging the reputation of a royal prince. He called the trial unnecessary and abominable. Barrister Peter Clark is a descendant of Gordon Cumming's lawyer and has made a study of the Tranby Croft case. The opening day of the trial, the court would have had a very strange look. Lord Coleridge presiding. This was something that was going to be done in the full glare of the Lord Chief Justice's court in the Strand. Uh, the heir to the throne sat next to Lord Coleridge on the bench. Edward would remain on the bench throughout. Here he was well placed to influence proceedings and undermine Gordon Cumming. From the contemporary sketches, he has a rather amused expression on his face as he's sitting on the bench, um, knowing that he's the center of the way about what's going on. Uh, the jury would be in approximately this position and looking straight across at the Prince of Wales as they heard every bit of evidence. Uh, the jurors would have been surprised and in awe uh, of the heir to the throne being within feet of them. When he was asked his opinion, Edward didn't hesitate. The juror stood up and asked the Prince of Wales, what was your Royal Highness's opinion at the time as to the charges made against Sir William Gordon Cumming? And the Prince of Wales turned to his side to, to face the juror. The charges appeared to be so unanimous that it was the proper course. No other course was open to me than to believe them. The case was now effectively closed. The jury's verdict went against Gordon Cumming. Plainly, their verdict had been affected by the Prince of Wales's evidence. Gordon Cumming faced social death. Edward's dignity had been wounded, but not fatally. The whole Tramby 
scandal um, affected him tremendously because again here he was in court and to the world revealed the fact that there he was gambling for money it seemed to underline what his mother had all along been saying that he simply that he was feckless that he lived for pleasure that he was indiscreet and it was sobering and coming late in life when he really people thought he should have been too old to be leading that kind of life anymore it, it did have a certain effect on him definitely after Tranby Croft Edward finally graduated from adolescence into adulthood just in the nick of time well, by the 1890s he's 50 he is aware that his mother being in her 70s can't go on forever and I think what we see changing in him is the knowledge that he could any day uh, wake up and find that he is king, which is perhaps something he hadn't felt 10 or 15 years earlier. And I think to an extent he kept slightly more careful company after that. A sign of Edward's maturity was his new mistress, a society lady, Alice Keppel. Like her direct descendant, Camilla Parker Bowles, Alice would become the long-term companion of the Prince of Wales. She was, like all his mistresses, a very um, beautiful woman, a very uh, well-dressed woman, the kind of voluptuous sort of woman that, that he liked. The relationship is different from the early women. She was nobody's fool, Alice Keppel, and she knew how to handle him. She knew how to handle his very, very short temper. As he got older, so he became more uh, short-tempered, more gruff, and she served as a kind of liaison between him and... Alice's astuteness was essential to the older Edward because he had finally become a player on the political stage. His mother still kept him in the dark, so he had sought illumination from other sources. Marlborough House was the pinnacle of British society in the late 19th century. Anybody who got an invitation to come to dinner here had arrived. And whenever his smart friends came here, they would be talking about politics because that's what they did for a living. This is where he would uh, apply them with drink, take them to dinner, and find out what was going on in the world. And where he would acquire what he thought was the, the level of knowledge and understanding of current affairs that someone in his position ought to have. It became a sort of fetish for him. It became a, a way of getting his own back on his mother. If you're going to stop me doing this officially, I'm going to do it unofficially. And because of my popularity in society, and my magnetism over these people. They will come to me and they will tell me these things, whether you like it or not. Edward's informal intelligence network spread far and wide throughout Europe, which he frequently visited. The Europe that he grew up in, as Prince of Wales, was run by about four or five hundred families. They were the, the chancellors, they were the foreign ministers, they were the ambassadors, they were the generals, they were the chiefs of staff, they were even the, the archbishops in all these continental countries. And if you were at the top of that pyramid, you'd function not through papers and archives, but through this unique nexus of links that she had as the leader of European society. Edward became known as the uncle of Europe. And a frequent topic of conversation at his dinner table was the aggressive behavior of one of his nephews, the German emperor, Kaiser Wilhelm. The Kaiser was always banging on about being an emperor. There was all this bombast, all this show. A total unpredictability. He did perfectly calm and peaceful for a month or two at a time, and then suddenly something would get hold of him, and he makes some great, uh, undramatic, bombastic, arrogant speech, which would set the whole of Europe tittering. They'd say, God, what, what, what's Germany going to do now? Although 18 years his junior, the Kaiser had what his uncle didn't have, power. He dismissed Edward as that vain old peacock, and Edward's dislike of his nephew was no secret. To describe that relationship briefly, one could only say that it was bad uh, on both sides. It involved imperial rivalry, it involved naval rivalry. The Kaiser built an enormous navy, which only uh, could really be directed against uh, us, or at least so Edward thought. For Edward, German power. His other major anxiety was his mother's seclusion. These 20 seconds of film offer an exclusive glimpse of the widow of Windsor. To the general public, the queen remained simply invisible. She was very anxious never to have anything that was vulgar, and the idea of spectacle and pageant um, was not her idea of how a monarch, um, a dignified monarch, perhaps 
behaved. Edward, however, believed monarchs were there to be seen. Wanting himself to inherit a throne that is popular, he sees that he's going to have to spend his years as Prince of Wales doing things that will maintain its popularity. So if it means he has to go and open a few hospitals or cut a few ribbons at exhibitions, he'll do it because, it, again, he's very conscious of the good public relations of, of having that role. And it's because of the attitude his father and mother had taken towards him as a very young man. He always has this notion that there's something to prove. And one way that he can improve his own self-esteem is to be out in public and to be performing functions, however straightforward, trivial or ceremonial, but to do them well and to be popular. By the 1890s, Edward was making almost 50 major public appearances a year. He lent his support to thousands of hospitals and charities. While Edward added royal glamour to good works, in return, some much needed civic virtue rubbed off on him. Even his mother noticed how popular this made him. Edward was instrumental in persuading her that after all, you know, she needed to get the goodwill of the people to become more of a, as it were, of a people's monarch, to reinterpret the role of a monarch a bit more broadly and be prepared to be seen. Edward persuaded his mother to celebrate the major anniversaries of her coronation, the Jubilees of 1887 and 1897. The impresario of the Jubilees was Edward. He relished this chance to indulge his passion for dressing up and showing off. I think what both the Jubilees mean to him is that because he has now for 25 years been, as it were, the center of social life in this country, then naturally he plays a very full part in those Jubilees. It's a showcase for Britain, it's a showcase for the Queen, and it's also a bit of a showcase for him. The cheering crowds believed they were celebrating the climax of the Victorian era. In reality, they were enjoying a preview of the Edwardian age to come. In late January 1901, an important message left Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. It bore the news Prince Edward had waited for all his adult life. The message was from Sir James Reed, Queen Victoria's doctor. His diary records what he said. The 19th of January. Tell the Prince of Wales that in my opinion he ought not to go to Sandringham, but to remain in London ready to come here at a moment's notice. That I consider the Queen's condition is a most serious one, and that I think it quite possible she might be dead within a few days. Edward wasted no time. In hours he was here at his mother's bedside in Osborne House. In the evening, I took the Prince of Wales to see the Queen and to speak to her. After the Prince of Wales left, the Queen took my hand and repeatedly kissed it. She evidently, in her semi-conscious state, did not realize the Prince had gone and thought it was his hand she was kissing. Victoria's dying thoughts reflected her lifelong anxiety about the succession, as Reed's diary reveals. She looked in my face and said, I should like to live a little longer, as I have still a few things to settle. I have arranged most things, but there are still some left, and I want to live a little longer. I don't think she ever said that gracious, wonderful speech that the Prince of Wales had hoped for, that, you know, now I have full confidence in you, as it were, go forth and rule. I don't think that ever happened. Edward's last moment with his mother was typical of their difficult relationship. It was spoiled by the presence of his arch-rival, both personally and politically, Kaiser Wilhelm. Prince Edward did not want the Kaiser to come. None of the um, royal children wanted the Kaiser to come, but he professed a great love for his grandmother. He insisted that he wanted to be there, and he came. 22nd of January. The Queen is sinking. 
I had for the last hour been kneeling at her right side, supporting her in a semi-upright position, helped by the Kaiser, who knelt on the opposite side of the bed. The Prince of Wales was sitting behind me at the end. All the rest were round about. Her pulse kept beating well till the end. To close her eyes. It was a, a relief in many ways to rid himself of that oppressive burden that was his relationship with his mother and to take on another burden, that of the crown. Uh, that was something I think he found probably easier to cope with. Edward left the Isle of Wight as soon as possible. And one of his first acts as king was to donate Osborne, his hated childhood home, to the nation. When Edward was going back to the mainland, he noticed one of the boats was flying the royal standard at half-mast, and he asked why this was, and they said, of course, the queen was dead. And he said, but the king lives. That bespeaks a certain confidence and a certain moving forward. The moment his mother had died, he was king. And of course, he implemented changes at court very, very quickly. King Edward VII couldn't get aboard the state coach fast enough. Less than a month after his mother's death, he opened Parliament with a blast of pomp and ceremony. He would read the King's speech from his throne, dressed in full regalia, which hadn't been done for 50 years. The revival of ritual suited the status of a 20th century king. When the monarchy lost more and more of its uh, real authority, the only way to change the monarchy in some substantive fashion so that it had a reason to exist was to make it more of a symbolic monarchy and to make that symbolic monarchy uh, apparent in the eyes of the people. When not surrounded by ancient ceremony, Edward looked equally at home in the modern world. And he was always interested in new fads and fancies. Uh, he was for every one of them. He learned how to ride a bicycle, for example, uh, because it was a new fad. He took up golf briefly. Edward always liked new things. He embraced a um, lot of modern inventions, things like the motor car. He lost no time getting a motor car. He loved telephones. He loved electric lights. He didn't in any way live in the past. He um, welcomed anything that was modern and up-to-date and was, a, in a way, a kind of forward-looking king. It was the beginning of a new century. Edward was determined it was going to be a new form of monarchy, very much the end of a Victorian era um, and the beginning of an Edwardian one, that long Edwardian summer, which ended, of course, in the First World War. But he played a central role in forging the alliances which would fight him. He sees the role of the monarch in a not entirely logical way. While I think he would recognize that he had to act on the advice of the Prime Minister, there are certain areas in which he is passionately interested, I'm thinking particularly of foreign affairs, uh, where if he has a view, he will make that view known, and he would expect his view to be taken seriously, and it was a difficult time for everybody as a result. The king feared his bumptious nephew, the Kaiser, might lead Germany to war with France, a country Edward visited devotedly every year, but which few in Britain seemed to care for. France was what I might call the traditional enemy. We fought the French in the 18th century, uh, we fought the French in the Revolutionary Wars, we fought Napoleon. Uh, there was a long, long tradition of enmity. The Prime Minister, Arthur Balfour's solution, was to sit on the fence and let these two titans slug it out, a policy called splendid isolation. The King hadn't been sympathetic to splendid isolation. He had this great love of France. He didn't like his nephew, the Kaiser. He saw the French a natural ally against um, a ruler that he and a country and a culture that he regarded as deeply antipathetic. So Edward set out to redraw the political landscape. The uncle of Europe would show Britain and France that they could be allies. For help, he turned to a Portuguese diplomat, the Marquis de Soveral. He was nicknamed the Blue Monkey. He was really the darling of um, 
Edwardian society. Everybody knew him, very good looking in a sort of rather tough way, uh, but immense charm. He was the one man uh, with whom Edward, when king, shared all his secrets, including the great one of all. March the 1st, 1903, he gets his friend Sovereign, comes back in Paris. And uh, the king says to Sovereign, look, I have to make, will his time, the moment's come, to make a highly important political visit to the French president. Then he goes on to say, nobody here knows a thing about it. I haven't told the Prime Minister, I haven't told the Foreign Secretary, I haven't told my wife. This is between you and I for the time being. Now, you simply drive a coach and horses through the British Constitution by planning a highly important political trip without telling a Prime Minister, a Foreign Minister, or anybody else. Just your chum, the Portuguese, the Marquis de Sauveral. Sovereign arranged for Edward to be invited on an official visit to Portugal. But the Foreign Office, the Prime Minister at the time, had no interest in doing this. And you know, they may well have been right not to do so because of the dangers of provoking the Germans who were rearming at this stage and who were already talking about fears of encirclement. It was an incredibly delicate situation. The government was discouraging. It warned of the hostile reception the king could expect in France and urged him to keep his visit low-key and informal. Edward replied that the visit should be as official as possible and the more honours paid to him, the better. The stakes were high, the risks enormous. When he entered at Paris, there was a medium-sized crowd, but you would hear some anti-British shouts. Edward turned on the charm. This was, after all, his home away from home. He made a visit to town hall. He gave his little speech saying, thank you for your welcome in this city, where I always feel at home. And this phrase went round Paris like a streak of fire. Everybody was muttering, what happened? Chez moi, chez moi, chez moi. This is what the king said. With this wonderful charm he had, he wooed the crowds and won them over. 48 hours later, when he left, all you heard was vive le roi, vive l'Angleterre. And by the end of the time, they were saying vive notre roi, as if he were king of France. It had been a gamble, but it had come off. And he put in place what he wanted to put in place, which was the understanding of France. Within a year, the Entente Cordiale was signed, a treaty which guaranteed Britain and France wouldn't fight each other. Edward hoped this alliance would contain Germany and so secure peace in Europe. But a decade later, the Entente would develop into a full-blown military alliance. Edward would never have believed, I think, that within four years of his death there would be this great conflagration that would change the face of Europe forever. Edward's impact on domestic politics was minimal. By the time he came to the throne, the country was run by politicians. From 1905, the government was liberal, an intent on radical social change. He knew that if Parliament were better off trying to do it, and he had a very realistic view of what a monarch could achieve. Luckily, Edward's modest talents and appetite for company, which had so worried his mother, now suited him perfectly for the only role that was left. In his short reign of nine years, he pioneered the style of a modern monarch, a dignified figurehead with a popular touch. Edward VII was the most visible monarch that there had been. He was seen everywhere on the race courses, ten where cows. He genuinely enjoyed doing it. Almost one of the most important aspects of his life was as a great showman, as dressing well, as being the king, as being somebody really important. 
somebody very stylish. I think he loved every minute of it. It's all very easy to paint him as a man who was interested in shooting and sleeping with actresses who were not his wife uh, and in playing Baccarat. And, you know, you can make that caricature of him uh, as a pretty useless, idle man who for a few years happened to be King of England at a time when actually the politicians were running it. But I think he was, there was much more to him than that. When, after years of waiting, he got his chance to be king, he did it very well. By 1910, Edward's appetites had caught up with him. Age 69, his health had collapsed. As Dr. Reed's diary recorded, At 10, saw the king. His majesty seemed to me worse. Went away and came back at 12. Saw the king repeatedly. At five, the queen arrived from the continent. But even at the end, Edward dodged the respectability he'd spent a lifetime evading. Queen Alexandra wasn't the only woman at the king's bedside. His mistress, Alice Keppel, insisted on being admitted to say her last goodbye. Towards afternoon, he gradually became quite unconscious. At 11.45, he died. Find out more about Edward VII on the Real Lives website at channel4.com forward slash plus. Well, next on four, look at how the modern monarchy has weathered that recent media storm. A right royal blunder, the Sophie and Edward story, is in a moment. <laughs>